Welcome and thank you very much for joining us on episode 131 of the Blazer's Edge podcast presented to you today by blazersedge.com. I'm your weekend host, Chris Lucia. And I'm your weekend co-host, Brandon Goldner. You can get in touch with the Blazer's Edge weekend podcast at blazersedgepodcast at gmail.com. And please rate, review, and subscribe to us on both iTunes and Stitcher. And please subscribe to us on YouTube. Yes. So, Brandon, this is, uh, I'm happy to announce, uh, the first official podcast where we're actually recording in the same room together. So we thought it would be fun uh, to get together and watch the game. We were hoping... We thought that would be fun. Yeah, we, we, we were expecting a bit more of a close contest here. And so we thought it would be really interesting to watch the game and then immediately following the game... Uh, we would start, you know, recording the podcast and have some uh, fresh hot takes right out the oven for you. But unfortunately, the Blazers ended up losing by what tonight? Twenty points. Yeah, it looked a lot the same as Game One did, which is unfortunate because you would hope that the things that went wrong in the first game, the Blazers would be able to adjust to. And while they seemed to be into the game uh, most of the way through near the end, it did just look like the same old thing. And all I can say about it is one of the tweets we got from our folks on Twitter is a picture of the Blazers on the team playing everybody photoshopped with crying Jordan faces. And that is, I think, how <laughs> everyone in Portland feels right about now, would you say? Yeah, so it, the, the game the game itself has it, it's certainly enough to take the, the wind out of the sails of, of any fan and, and certainly, you know, us, you know, trying to talk about the game. But there, there are certainly plenty of things to talk about here because... There were so many adjustments, uh, you know, from game one to game two that we were talking about with Terry Stotts, and now we saw the adjustments that that he made on both offense and defense, and we saw how that worked out. So now we're seeing Plan A and Plan B. So we kind of have, you know, a bit more of a of a full a full bank to draw from when we're, when we're. Uh, or, or evidence rather. You Anytime know, you double your sample size, it helps for sure. Absolutely right. So we're going from one to two. So uh, there's there's definitely you know more to talk about. I think absolutely, and, and I think you know if you start a series with two blowout losses, maybe it kind of tempers the expectations of the fan base a little bit to where to where you're maybe not so much thinking okay how can the Blazers win this series. Uh, to maybe, you know, what could they do to make it competitive? How dare you, sir? <laughs> I mean, when you lose the first two games on the road in the playoff series, if you go through the stats, history dictates that you're not in good shape. It doesn't matter how closely you're matched with the other team. And for a 4-5 matchup, it's not like the Blazers are totally being blown out of the water. But, I mean, if you look at the end result of both games, um, actually, they are getting blown out of the water. It just doesn't seem like they should be falling so far behind as they are. Um, but, yeah, I mean... There are still, you know, two games coming up at the Moda Center. I don't know. So so the only thing that I found a little bit troubling about this, Chris, was uh, it's like I said a little bit ago, the adjustments that you want to see the Blazers make, they didn't really seem to make. I mean, they played pretty poorly all game. And, I mean, to the Blazers' credit, they did hold Los Angeles to 25-point quarters in the first, second, and third quarter. They allowed 35 points in the fourth. But... Some of the, some of the same things that plagued them in game one seem to be plaguing them in game two. But I mean, the optimist in me says they're going back to Portland. You're down 0-2, but that's just how you split. I mean, they're on track for a seven-game series. Yeah. So I have to I have to ask, uh, Brandon, you you on the podcast last week, you explicitly stated in no uncertain terms uh, that you genuinely believed the Blazers would win this series in seven. Uh, after the first two games where they lost by a combined, was it 40 points? That's possible. <laughs> uh, looking back on that prediction, are you feeling pretty confident about that personally, or are you beginning to maybe second-guess the Blazers in seven? You know, I'm not feeling as confident about it, I think, as any <laughs> reasonable person would admit if they expect their team to win a series, they probably don't want to see them going out 2-1 now. It is also true that I call the seven-game series. That's right. Seven-game series essentially would be a coin flip. And if you can get to game seven, if you can get that far, it's it doesn't necessarily matter how poorly you did to begin with. That would mean, though, if the Blazers were to be in a position to get to game seven, they would have to make adjustments beyond what they did in this game, too. And as much as I would like to talk about the fact the game was close, it was pretty grindy. 
it wasn't the prettiest offensive game for either team, but it was close until the end. Even if the Blazers had lost by four or six or eight, I'd be feeling a little bit better than I do now. But another 20-point loss, I mean, we can go up and down the stats. I will admit to you, it doesn't make me feel particularly heartened. So I, I want to I want to get to some Twitter questions because we did solicit solicit some questions from uh, uh, listeners and users online. And bless the souls of all the folks who are contributing after a loss. I mean, we didn't put yeah. the call out until there was like a minute left in the game. No, absolutely. So we we really appreciate those, and I want to get to those. But I, I want to I want to ask you, you know, up front, Brandon, what do you, what do you think here? You know, if you think that the Blazers still have potential to push this this series to seven, then you you must think that home court advantage is huge in this series, and being on playing on your home court is huge because if the Blazers are going to be you know coming back from two insane blowouts, I mean these were games where that that first one was out of hand. A little earlier on but the second one they were within four points at the halftime and then they just kind of the Clippers just slowly kind of built their lead while the Blazers offense completely stalled and that was to me it was it was somewhat disheartening um, as, a, as a fan you know watching the team kind of expecting or hoping for the Blazers to maybe build some kind of a lead and come back but it seemed like every potential run that they could have gone on was stifled you know, so you must think that if the Blazers are going to make the series competitive, being on the home court at the Moda Center is going to be huge for them, right? So what kind of effect are you thinking that playing at home for the Blazers is going to have for these guys? I mean, it definitely should have some effect. That's why teams prefer to play at home. That's why teams have had better home records since the beginning of time. Part of that may be officiating that wasn't particularly fair to the road team. I think in years past, that's more of an issue than it is now. So, I mean, I have no issues with the officiating either one of these games, to be perfectly honest with you. But yeah, no, I think it will help. I think it's particularly going to help folks who've been in a slump. I mean, Aminu. Right. If you have players who are not in the rhythm, they're not comfortable, they're not making shots, maybe they're taking it a little bit hard, they're putting it on themselves, knowing that, hey, if I could just act as a release valve for Dame and CJ, that maybe they'd be playing better too. It's always frustrating. Like. I think in basketball, it's one thing if you're not being particularly amazing on any given day, and I think people can more or less live with that, but it's another thing if you feel like you're actively hurting your team, and I would argue that Aminu is actively hurting the Blazers by not being able to hit a shot, wouldn't you agree? Well, yeah, I mean, it, what, he was so he was, what, two for eight in the first game, and then he had a ofer in the, in the second game from yeah, outside. One for seven from deep. Yeah, I mean, so... A combined three for fifteen. Is it is that shooting twenty percent from outside? Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, that's any any time that happens, uh, you know, from a guy who is hitting that at a at a thirty six percent rate for the season. And not only that, I, and you were we were mentioning it before we started recording that those shots they're open shots. Right. Right. So I, I'm I'm kind of wondering here, you know. This this series. So when did they they wrapped the season uh, on Wednesday, and their first game in LA was on Sunday. So you have all that time in between games. I'm not sure when they got into LA. Probably Friday or Saturday. Uh, and then the next game uh, after Sunday being on Wednesday night. You know what I mean. So they're spending four or five nights in in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, away from home. You know, I, I that's a lot of time in between games for a guy like Aminu uh, to shoot, you know, two for eight from the floor and have it be so, you know, glaringly obvious that that was part of what could have affected the outcome of that game. That's, that's a lot of time to think about that. And even if you have days of practice in between to put your shots up, I mean, that's got to be in your head quite a bit. Well, and wasn't Al Farouk Aminu drafted by Olshea in Los Angeles? Yes, absolutely he was. So I wonder, I don't know. If there's any, I mean, he didn't play a particularly large role there when he was a player, right? I mean, he was drafted more as someone who they thought that he would get better later in his career, not necessarily the impact he'd bring right when they drafted him. Right, yeah, and he was more of an impact player with uh, New Orleans and Dallas. Right. So maybe there's not some kind of, you know, or maybe there is. Maybe he feels like he wanted to play really well in front of his former home crowd and just wasn't able to do it. But, I mean, you talk about the days off between games. 
So, I mean, they have another three days off now, or two days off, rather. So they get Thursday and Friday off. That means they get to go back to Portland probably now. If I were the Blazers, and they probably are getting on the plane right now, they want to get home as soon yeah. as possible. If it were LaMarcus, he would have... <laughs> I mean, if it were LaMarcus, you know. he would have already been on the plane that left <laughs> yeah. right as the game got out. Yeah, that was, that was pretty bizarre. But at any rate, I would be trying to get back to Portland as quick as I can. My sense is that that's usually what NBA teams do. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So the Blazers will have a little bit of time at home to adjust. And so just to loop back to your question and close it, I think the crowd will play some part. I don't know if it's the difference between a 20-point loss and a win. <laughs> right. But. Well, if they, I mean, if they're going to push this series to seven, they have to win all their home games. They're going to have to win all their home games. And, you know, so that, that, that home crowd is going to have to bring it. I think, you know, Aminu seems to me like, you know, offensively, and I, I suppose defensively, I guess in general, overall, he's kind of a a cerebral player. And and I think that, you know, in, in games where I've watched him at the Moda Center this year, there's a handful of times, he seems like the kind of guy that can really feed off the energy of a crowd. And so when when he's playing well, the crowd's hyped on him because the nature of the way that he plays is really easy to cheer for when he's playing well. When he's playing poorly it kind of makes you slap your head a little bit sometimes, you know, when he's trying to take guys off the dribble uh, and, you know, turning the ball over. That's that's not something that's going to get the crowd lit up, but when he's playing well, that gets the crowd uh, up on their feet. It's definitely conducive for that. And I think uh, the crowd and the media can kind of feed off each other. You know, I think, you know, not being in the same city for four days in a row or however long it was, being able to think about, you know, what went wrong in that in that first game, Uh, Because that's got to be kind of a weird feeling to know that an opposing team on this big of a stage is so willing to leave you wide open. Yeah, I mean, it it has to feel kind of disorienting. I can't remember any other point during the season where Minu's been left that wide open. And And, and you would think that he would be because leading up to this point, you know, he was a, I think he was a 31%. A career shooter heading into the season he's brought that up to like 32 percent uh you know but he was definitely a below average three-point shooter for this season so it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be any type of a surprise uh that he would be left open during the reg- regular season but he really wasn't to this degree i mean he definitely got more open shots than say a uh, lillard or mccollum uh you know but you know, he he definitely wasn't get getting left open the way he is this series. Absolutely not. No, not at all. I mean, and we talked a little bit about the importance of Aminu. It's not necessarily just for the numbers that he would bring and for the shots that he would make, but it's the effect that has when you have players besides Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum who can take the pressure off of them, and it just it makes it easier for everybody else. And so, when that's your role and you're not hitting your shots, it makes it all the more difficult. Yeah, he, he's definitely one of those energy uh, energy guys who can play off the home crowd, and and I think, you know, Dame is as well. And you see, you know, McCollum too. Actually, uh, the way he is interacted with the crowd a couple times, you know, you see Ed Davis with the flex. You know, you have uh, Lillard time or Dame time, however you want to call it. Uh, you know, McCollum, you see him do the flex every now and then. I mean, I've seen, I've been at games where when Chris Kamen gets in. Uh, and makes a shot. There's literally a standing ovation at at the end of the game, or at you know anytime, anytime he pretty much touches the ball. And talk about another former Clipper, Chris Kamen. <laughs> well, I mean, and Cool Breeze is from Los Angeles too. There you so, go. So there's, there's certainly like all kinds of ties, uh, you know, to the area and, and to the team. You know, obviously with Neil O'Shea, uh, Chris McGowan was president of what was it, the Los Angeles Kings, I think, in the NHL. So I mean. There's certainly all kinds of ties for the Blazers in L.A. Maybe getting back home, getting in in the same bed at night, uh, getting in the same routine that you're consistently used to, getting up shots in your practice facility, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's going to be great for all the players, obviously, and the coaching staff and, and everybody from the top to the bottom, but certainly guys like like Aminu and, and Lillard and McCollum and Ed Davis who definitely you know seem to play off the home crowd. Uh, but I, I do want to get to these uh, Twitter questions because I think you know we could cover a lot of ground with these as well. Uh, and, and I just want to start maybe uh, you know toss you kind of an interesting one here that maybe uh, you might have a solid take on. And this comes from Ryan McCullough. That's uh, at Ryan Mac eight nine five on Twitter. 
Uh, Ryan asks, are the Blazers the whiniest team in the league right now? I swear if Dane put the same energy into defense that he does complaining uh, and he trails off there. But, you know, is it is this something for you, Brandon, where you are noticing that Damian Lillard is complaining to the extent that it is affecting his ability to play competent defense in this series? No. And it's funny that someone would make a comment about the Blazers being the whiniest team in the league when they're playing the Los Angeles Clippers one of the quantifiably whiniest teams <laughs> of our generation. How would, you, I, how would you quantify that? I was just curious. Well, I, I'll tell you, it's not arbitrary. That's number one. <laughs> number two, quantifiably as in, if you were to take a breakdown, like if, if stats.nba.com had a breakdown of the number of times that a coach contested a call to an official, I'd like to see where Doc Rivers stood in the annals of time, you know how I'm sure have, that he'd be, uh, his percentage would be way up there. They have the the miles traveled for players, right? So if they had miles traveled for coaches, are you saying Doc Rivers would would lead the league? Yeah, and it's not just that it's Doc Rivers, right? It's that Doc Rivers is the GM, Doc Rivers is the coach, Doc Rivers controls the team. The team runs pretty well, frankly, but they take his cue, they take their cues from Doc Rivers, and so they have Chris Paul. And not only is Chris Paul whiny. Chris Paul is a player who's very, you can call him crafty, you can call him a veteran player. He's been around forever. He's super strong. I mean, Eric Griffith had an article about Chris Paul before game one. You should check it out. But Chris Paul is as whiny as they come, first of all, and second of all, creates that contact and tries to deceive the referees into giving calls that are favorable to him. Blake Griffin, mm, I mean, he's not super, super, super duper whiny. Anyway, (laughs) examples abound. And it's funny because, I mean, J.J. Redick has talked in the past because he's not particularly, um, you know, outspoken with the officials, J.J. Redick. And I think that he's even talked before about how he doesn't necessarily prefer that approach to officiating, but he understands that that's how his team kind of looks at it, and so he's okay yeah. with it more or less. So, But to say the Blazers, the whiniest team in the league, you have the Rockets, you have the Clippers, those two right there, just, I mean, 1A and 1B. Well, so, Also listening, you know, I, I don't – I. I think that guys who are calling the game for you know a specific team, you have to take what they say with a grain of salt, you know, and, and maybe you know add whatever Homer preface there might be to this. But you know, Mike and Mike, you know, one of the takes that they've had pretty consistently, uh, you know, when talking about you know the way that the Clippers, you know, from Doc Rivers on down to the players, the way that they politic the refs you know over the course of a game you know one thing they've said is it's a very civil way of putting it (laughs) one 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 thing they've said is that you know you see you know Stotts definitely lets the officials know that he's there but he's not a guy who's going to ride the officials consistently all game uh, and the players aren't necessarily unless it's you know egregious uh take that with a grain of salt so you you you're playing the clippers and and you're generally you generally take a laid back approach but you constantly are seeing doc rivers in every single ref's ear you're seeing chris paul in the ref's ear you're seeing uh, blake griffin in the ref's ear uh, jamal crawford uh you know yeah, i it, forgot about jamal crawford it's you don't you, you never want to allow how how do you, how do you say this you don't you don't want to stoop to someone else's level, I guess is is kind of a, for lack of a better uh, phrase for that. But what else are you going to do if, if you feel like you're not getting, if you feel like the referee, the officials only have a certain amount of time to listen, uh, you know, to whatever coaches and they're giving 75% of it to another team or another coach, don't you you feel like you kind of have to, you know, get in there at some point and, and let your voice be heard. I mean, this is, this is more or less, I feel like what Mike and Mike are saying. I, I tend to think that like, if I were to take, try to take a laid back approach and on the other end there, I was seeing, you know, Chris Paul and Doc Rivers do their thing. I would want to take the classic route, but it would be hard for me. It would be hard for me to not stoop to that level. I have to admit. I'm just thinking about if I'm a coach playing in a game where the other coach is constantly gnawing at the refs, I'm making a judgment about whether that's productive for the other team 
that is going to inform whether or not I mimic whatever they're doing. I think that there are times when coaches and teams are complaining to referees and it's counterproductive. I think in those situations, it's probably better not to say anything, but I could certainly see if you think it's effective that you might want to pick up on that too. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about winning basketball games. Right. So in my book, as long as what you're doing is not cheating or trying to hurt someone else, actually, that's a big one for me, then I say go for it. Here's the thing. I don't believe that complaining to the referees is particularly effective unless you do it the right way. I have not been in the NBA. Chris, I'll admit, I'm going to admit for the first time, I've never been an NBA player myself. Shocking. Shocking. I mean, the 6'2", you know, can hop over a phone book probably. (laughs) But it doesn't seem to me the way Doc Rivers approaches handling the officials and the other players on his team, I don't think that's a particularly effective way of dealing with it. And officials do a good job of tuning that stuff out. I don't know if that's the most effective way to do it. And I think, as you said earlier, Terry Stotts does have it in him to bring up concerns that he has, but he does it in a way that seems like they're resonating more with the officials, but that's just how it, how it seems to me, the observer. So do you, do you think that Dame needs to tone it down a little bit? No, do you, I think do you disagree with it. Like, I don't even think Ryan Damian said. Lillard complains all that much. Do you? I mean, he, I, he, I think he complains as much as any other star. I mean, as a lot of other star players in the league. I mean, he seems there's sometimes where he gets up and he looks hopping mad uh, after he doesn't get a call, and and sometimes it was a missed call. Sometimes it wasn't. It seems like he more or less expects calls that players of his status get at this point, and when he's not seemingly getting them. He definitely seems to be a player who will let his voice be heard to the officials. I mean, I don't know if I would say whiny if we're complaining him across the board to you know any other player of his status. I would, but I would he say definitely that lets his voice be heard. I would say that he's solidly the median of that spectrum. Okay. I mean, that's that that's definitely fair. I mean, and then you know maybe that's this is just frustration. You know, um, you know Ryan's question is, you know. A bit, you know, you're watching the Clippers do this, and and it's it's on the front of your mind, and it's something we all talk about, you know, when we're talking about the games. This is one of the first things you talk about is the way they handle the officials. So, this is definitely going to be a talking point in the series, I guess. Uh, to to loop it all back in, I would say, you know, personally, Dame's not not being egregious egregious with his complaining. I don't think this series. I just think it's it's kind of a point. Uh, it's kind of a point that we've kind of beat to death on this series, and it's definitely at the front of everybody's mind. So uh, let's move on to another question here. Uh, it's kind of related to what we talked about a little earlier with Amina, but we can get a little more into it. Uh, this is from Jacob Meyer. Uh, that's at Meyer underscore Jacob. Asks, why play Aminu at all? Uh, give Crab a chance. A uh, better three-point shooter means... Uh, they could probably outscore. Gosh, this one's kind of hard to paraphrase, as a matter of fact. Um, obviously, that defensive approach doesn't work. So I think the essence of the question is Aminu isn't seeming to help on the offensive end at all. And in fact, he's being kind of a net negative. So is is what he does on the defensive end worth how much help he brings or the lack of help on the offensive end? Does it offset? I think that there are a couple things to unpack there. One of them is Aminu's play, but the other one is his suggestion that Alan Crabb be the one to take Aminu's place. So just to say the Blazers bench was pretty woeful tonight. They didn't play a ton of minutes, but they only scored 10 points. And Alan Crabb was part of that problem. He only took three shots in 18 minutes. He didn't have any rebounds. So I don't know if necessarily Alan Crabb would be the answer if you're thinking Aminu is languishing somewhat. I mean, Aminu's shooting was again we talked about it a bunch was terrible again this game one for seven from deep four for 13 from the field but he did have double digit rebounds he did have a couple of steals he did have some assists and it wasn't just that either I mean there were a couple of series and I'm not sure if Aminu was involved in each of them but he was involved in at least a couple of them where there were offensive rebound after offensive rebound for the Blazers and Aminu was mixed up in that and I That's something that he brings. I mean, those 10 rebounds, I think, are probably a little bit inflated because of some of those series. But there's something that Aminu brings on defense, which Alan Crabb 
will pro- possibly get to that point at some point in the future, but isn't quite there. And the other thing is you need a meaning to keep shooting, and we said that after game one, but... So I would, I would say, no, don't rotate Aminu out for Crab. I wouldn't do that. I would tend to agree with you on that because I personally think that Aminu has played a pretty serviceable job, uh, you know, Harkless as well, kind of in that, in that forward tandem position that they've been playing the late stretch of the season since Myers got hurt. You know, I, I think it's been overall pretty effective. I think you've come this far with it. I don't think it's time yet to start doing anything, you know, crazy to, you know, like like putting in Alan Crabb at the four to maybe change it now. If the Blazers get blown out in game three at the Moda Center, then maybe it's time to throw, you know, throw Crabb out there and, and give him an opportunity and see what he can do. Because what I'm what I'm kind of thinking here is, and, and you can tell me if I'm not remembering this correctly, but uh, last season down the stretch of the season, uh, before he, I believe he hurt his shoulder. I can't remember what the specific injury was. Uh, but Darrell Wright was playing a really effective stretch role uh, at the at the four position, you know, for the Blazers. You know, at least offensively, he was playing well. Uh, defensively, because he was playing uh, more so against bench players, I think they were able to hide him a little more effectively than they would say be able to hide Crab defensively. Um, uh, if he were, you know, to be playing the both the forward positions, because you know something that's that's important, you know, for Al Farouk Aminu and Harkless uh, is you know playing those those forward positions positions together, and maybe why you can't do it with a guy like you know Alan Crabb or a guy like Henderson, and and this I suppose we can tie in. Uh, I think we have another Twitter question about this too, uh, about why Henderson doesn't get moved up in the lineup a little bit, I believe. Uh, I want to make sure that we get credit for who asked this at at any rate. uh, You know, the reason why I think you're not seeing Crabb and Henderson move up in that lineup is because being able to switch uh, defensively is so important with with the bigs. So, you know, you can get by with Aminu and Harkless switching with Mason Plumlee. Uh, You can also get by with them switching on smaller guards and, and wings as well. You bring uh, Alan Crabb into the fold and Gerald Henderson into the fold. I think Henderson's strong enough. I think Crabb would do his best, give his best effort. Uh, but in terms of having the length, you know, I think Harkless's and I think Aminu's length is so important in their ability to be able to defend guys. And, and if you're talking about replacing Aminu in, in the starting lineup, I mean, that means you're putting starting crab out against Blake Griffin. Yeah. I mean, I mean, is that what you want to do here? That's not sustainable. That's not sustainable by any metric, and that wouldn't work. Jeff so. Green, Jeff Green, maybe. I, I might give you Jeff Green because I think he's enough of a non-factor offensively for the most part that I think you could probably get away with crab. Yeah, you can get away with the Jeff Green, but not with the Blake Griffin. Yeah, that I, Blake Griffin's going to be healthy this series. I don't see that happening. And then, and then you start thinking about switching um, and help side defense. And I just don't think they have you know the length to really be able to withstand what the Clippers can bring uh, at them. I think you know you're looking at how the Clippers are able to exploit uh, exploit their current starting lineup. I think that gives them even more of an opportunity uh, you know for exploitation. I think you'd be seeing Blake Griffin really making some post rising dunks. I think DeAndre Jordan would be making life really difficult on on Alan Crabb or, or Gerald Henderson. Um, you know, whomever you would be switching out with with Aminu. So uh just to give credit to that to bring Henderson into there, that's from Mac uh Canifax, Mac at Mac underscore Canifax ten, he asked, uh, or he or she asked, thoughts on switching Henderson and Harkless. So it's basically, you know, the the concept of switching in one of those, one of those other wings for one of those other guys who's playing up, and really, to me, I just, I just don't think it's realistic to, to expect those, you know, wings to be able to play up against against guys the level of Blake Griffin. And when we're talking about players that can play a couple different positions, we have another question from Twitter from Toby M Green that he asks here. She asks. Does this series show the need to scrap or delay the Vonley experiment? So I don't know if Von, Noah Vonley's played at all in this series yet, has he? 
Yeah, well, in, in game one, so the minutes in game two that came in was getting, uh, that's where Noah Vonley was in the rotation in game one. Okay, but he didn't have any kind of meaningful impact, and it doesn't look like he is going to have any kind of meaningful impact on this series, not that I can see. Well, it depends. It depends on who you ask. I mean, so maybe we shouldn't be thinking about bringing in Crab or bringing in Henderson for Harkless or Aminu. Maybe the question here is: Do you go back to? Do you revert back to that starting lineup with Noah Vonley? Uh and I mean, and bring Harkless off the bench? Because I can't imagine at this point in the season moving Aminu into a bench role. I mean, you've played what 84 games with him as the starting as, as as a starting forward i think harkless would be a much more seamless move to the bench but harkless has shown a lot of confidence as a starter yeah and the other thing too is that if you i mean now we're trying to bake in the fact that aminu is not going to hit a shot but if you think about removing harkless's even the threat for him to shoot the three, I mean, he hit two for four tonight. Vonley doesn't yet have the skill to hit a three. That's something that's in his pocket, but he hasn't developed yet. So if you were to rotate Noah Vonley into the starting lineup, so you'd have CJ McCollum and Damian Lillard who can hit threes, Aminu who can't hit the broadside of a barn, Mason Plumley who doesn't shoot threes, and then Noah Vonley who maybe someday can shoot a three but hasn't shown it at all lately. So that would be very, very tough. And the other thing about Noah Vonley too, I mean, you're talking about this is the playoffs – that's why is it that Chris Kamen hasn't played any meaningful minutes in any game all year and now he's playing double digit minutes I mean and I mean somewhat of an aside I wanted to see Chris Kamen put somebody in the spin cycle that classic <laughs> Kamen spin cycle and we got it today and it, it worked out just as horribly as you thought it might have I think that he got he tried to put uh, <laughs> who's he tried to put in that spin cycle? He just got like double blocked or like stumbled and it was horrible. I mean, so at at one end of the the floor, and we're as we're watching the game together, the you know I said, you know, at least Chris came in defensively. He can play that that kind of backstop role. You see him drop pretty hard in the pick and roll. Uh, you know he's not he's not going to hedge super hard, but at least you get you know a big back there to protect the rim a little bit. Uh, and, and you know I was just complimenting his comp competency uh, in in his ability to protect the rim, at least in the context of you know who the Blazers have to put out there at the at the center position right now. And then on the other end of the floor, I mean you just see exactly why you. Cayman's not a rotation player in the NBA right now because he just he has the desire to score that he did when he was an All Star uh, with the Clippers, but he doesn't have the ability anymore uh, to take a guy off the dribble and and those the moves that he has the spin cycle you mentioned that's going to work against you know reserve players maybe in a regular season game. And, you know, occasionally he can bust out the magic, you know. You, you, I mean, I'm sure Andre Miller can put up 20 points a game every now and then. But this isn't something that is consistent. And I think it's, you know, with a guy like Miller, I think you've noticed him adjust his game as he's aged uh, and be a bit more realistic about his abilities. You know, Chris Kamen, offensively, I, I'm I'm seeing him get the ball on offense and i'm wondering you know personally is is he going to pass the ball back out and for a guy who's playing the role that he's playing for this team i mean i think he's out there to be a competent defender for the blazers and offensively to set solid screens i don't think that terry stotts is putting him out there and i could be completely wrong i'm not i'm not i'm not behind the bench here hearing anything that stotts is saying so maybe maybe the, the, this is speculation here to say that Chris Kamen is going a little bit rogue on the game plan. But if I'm looking at Terry Stotts' offense and the way that they've played to this point in the season, you know, dumping the ball into a big and having him back it up and, and put up seven or eight spin moves and get up – seven or eight spin moves, sorry, seven or eight pump fakes, you know, and get deep into the shot clock and put up a contested, you know, hook shot, I don't – I feel like that's in the game plan. Well, I feel like it's kind of like an NBA 2K thing where you're just like playing with your little brother or someone and there's kind of button mashing. And it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like you, 
back in the day you could play as Allen Iverson and be like, crossover, 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 crossover. And eventually the guy would bite <laughs> yeah, on it, right? Like, yeah, like a loping spin move. And so, I mean, you're right. And you said it during the game, too, that Chris Kamen, for his diminished skill set, for the moves that his brain wants to execute but his body just can't make happen quite anymore, just maybe if he passed a little bit more, it would be nice if he didn't automatically feel like he had to make something happen because one place where Cayman I thought was pretty effective even he only took six shots but well how many minutes did he play with nine minutes ten minutes yeah that's true yeah no it's I mean that's that's, a lot of shots for ten minutes he shouldn't be the first or second option when he's out there no but there were some times when he had a relatively uncontested jumper he hit one missed a couple but well, he, you have to keep the defense honest, right? But That's right. But backing up a defender no, not and that. doing an ISO post move, I mean... Not that. No, but when, when he's open and he doesn't hesitate, that is great. Like you said, I mean, keeping the defense honest means that people are kind of going towards you and opening up everything else around you, and that's fine. But yeah, what you don't want to see is him backing someone up, putting them in the Cayman spin cycle. And I want to be clear, if this isn't clear already, when I say the Cayman spin cycle... I'm not talking about a perfectly polished, well-executed <laughs> basketball move. I'm talking about Chris Kamen's little spin move, right? As so there's some derision behind that term when I say the Kamen spin cycle. It means a certain thing. It means Kamen at his diminished skills now. So, yeah, I mean, I th- I, it, if you're talking about Chris Kamen as being one of your rotation players in the playoffs, that's not a great thing if you're the Blazers, I don't think. So at at this point, though, does he legitimately help the Blazers win games more than Noah Vonley would? I think that he does. I think that he does, and I think that that's, again, kind of a bummer for the Blazers. You'd hope that Noah Vonley is still, let's, just to qualify, he's still very, very young, okay? And he's a big, big guy. Big guys take a little while to develop, historically speaking. So... I think, though, the Blazers wanted Noah Vonley to be good enough to be out there and not kind of cause trouble, which, I mean, frankly, when he started during the regular season, you know, non-playoff environments, he's done well enough to be out there and not do much wrong. But he also doesn't bring a whole lot necessarily that he does right. He's just sort of there. But clearly Terry Stotts doesn't trust this guy to be out during the playoffs and do the same thing, right? So... I don't know. I, 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 Chris Kamen being a rotation player, not a great thing, but is he better than Noah Vonley right now? Yes, he is. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I think the, you know, the defensive presence, if, if for nothing else, uh, the size and being able to take up space and having you know, such a big, long body at the rim, I think that that's effective. I would just love to see Chris accept a reduced role in his advanced NBA age, as it were. Uh, but... Uh, moving on, I think we have you know a question or two uh, more we can touch on from Twitter here. Uh, so we we have one from Jeff Ellsworth. That's at Els Bells, uh, 08. Jeff asks, should Stotts consider adjusting the rotation so that Dame uh, is on the court more when Chris Paul rests? I don't know if that really has so much to do with it, right? Well, I how mean, does that work? I you know. I think that what they're trying to get at is should Dame, is, is that, that I think that what he's trying to say that Damian Lillard has not been playing his best and perhaps this is one way to help him play a little bit better. I don't think that trying to sneak Damian Lillard onto the court when there's no Chris Paul is a recipe for success. Well, Dame needs to rest too. I mean, right. but I think he's talking about staggering the rotation so that Damian Lillard's rest is you know, when Chris Paul is more on the court and that Damian Lillard spends more time on the court when Chris Paul is resting so that, I mean, presumably so Chris Paul isn't guarding Damian Lillard. And again, I don't think that's a recipe. How do you make that happen? How do you stagger the minutes with two starters who play 36 minutes a piece? You don't. There's no staggering of the minutes to make there. Yeah, you can't do that. Unless you want to play Damian Lillard, what, 42 minutes a game or something crazy i mean he's not going to be getting much rest if you only if you're waiting for chris paul to get off the floor and then you're leaving damian lillard out there uh, for long enough for him to be effective while chris paul is resting you're taking away uh two to three minute stretches two four five minutes occasionally uh where damian lillard would otherwise be resting so unless you're trying to play either unless you're trying to bring dame off the bench which is never going to happen 
or if you're trying to play him 46 minutes a game, there's just no way to strategically uh, rest or play Dame Lillard at a time that lines up with when, when Chris Paul is to be able to take advantage of it. You can't stagger against another team because a coach can do, he can put a guy back in. You know, I think maybe the solution is not necessarily to have Damian Lillard be out when Chris Paul is out, but let's just play Damian Lillard 48 minutes a game. I mean, I tweeted earlier that... Is Wilt, that what we should do? I mean, is that, is that the solution? Absolutely. Here? I just tweeted out a little earlier today from the Blazers Edge account that Wilt Chamberlain had a season in which he played more than 48 minutes per game in an entire season. For those of you counting at home, NBA games have been 48 minutes long for a very, very long time. So that means he played every minute of every game plus overtime on average. So it was that 1966? It was a very long time and, ago. It was <laughs> it was probably just a couple years after I was born. When when he was when he was what 6 foot 11 and the average player was 6 foot 4. Right. <laughs> this is not I mean actually it's that He wasn't expending a lot as much energy as Damian Lillard would be these days. You would you would suppose that he wasn't. I mean if you look at actually if you were to take a peek at the players throughout NBA history who have played the most minutes per game Many, many of those seasons are going back decades. And then the ones that you see that start coming up are Allen Iverson, Allen Iverson. And so, yeah, again, unless you're planning on playing Damian Lillard, Allen Iverson plus, plus, plus minutes, or if you're, yeah, if you're relegating Dame to a bench role. And I mean, think about this, like, so if Damian Lillard is out when Chris Paul comes back in, it's then who's guarding Chris Paul. I'd, so no, that's not going to happen. And at any rate, I don't think that you as a coach want to be staggering your players' minutes based on who's out there. I mean, you want to be able to adjust your rotations as need be to match what the other team is doing or, or, to, or to throw a counterpunch. But when it comes to your best player, that's not a consideration that you make as a coach. Absolutely not. And when, when you're at the point where you're adjusting your star player's minutes to coincide with the whims of another coach – how he's playing his star, I think you're already you have worse problems than that. I mean, your 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 back is squarely up against the wall at that point, and you're just uh, throwing stuff to see what sticks at, at that point. Quite frankly, I mean that's uh, so. I think there's 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 bigger problems there if if that's the route the Stotts is going. I don't I don't see that happening. And I think I think this kind of ties in here. Uh, to an overarching point that I wanted to make. And so we'll just get this last, I think, unless you had another one, uh, a Twitter question out of the way here, and then we can kind of address this. But I have from uh, Tyler Carter, uh, at T Carter 385 uh, what's the game plan for game three? And so I kind of want to just tie this all in here and refer this back to the last question as well. Because the, the point that I'm getting at, I think, is that if you're the one making the adjustments and you're allowing the opposing team to dictate the way that the game is going to be played, uh, the tempo, the style, and, and you, look at, you look at what's been happening with the Blazers uh, these first two games. So the Blazers get taken completely out of the game plan uh, by the Clippers trapping hard on the Blazers' ball handlers at the top of the key. So the Blazers' bread-and-butter play, you know, for the last handful of seasons, ever since Stotts has been there uh, with Damian Lillard as the pick-and-roll, that got taken completely away, uh, completely neutered by the Clippers' defense and their ability to trap. So what did the Blazers do, uh, you know, in Game 2 to avoid that? So you have the screener come up. Oftentimes you had... Uh, or I shouldn't say oftentimes, I saw this a few times, where you had the screener, you'd have another man actually come and there'd be an action to get the screen setter in the pick and roll open. So he doesn't have a man trailing as close and can't trap as hard, uh, or at least as effectively as they were in game one that gives the ball handler, in this in this case it was Damian Lillard, a little bit more breathing room. So... Uh, you, you have a bit more time to set a clean pick, but what I, what I was seeing was Damian Lillard wasn't hesitating uh, as much, wasn't allowing the play to develop. Uh, so he was able to split a ton of, of attempted double teams, or at least uh, when, when the big defender was showing pretty hard or hedging pretty hard, 
uh, you know, he was able to split that and get into the paint. Now the problem was because of the screener, uh, and, and this is the times that I noticed, uh, when Damian Lillard was splitting that double screen, or that double team, getting into the paint, uh, the screen setter was behind the play there. And so this would allow the, the Clippers defense to get set should you defer to him in the pick and roll anyway. So that didn't seem to work. Um, I mean, it, it worked a little bit, and you saw at times where it did, and the Blazers were able to keep the game close and competitive for the most part this game until the Clippers pulled away at the end. Uh, and then you saw you know, the Blazers, instead of relying on the pick and roll as much, you saw Dame uh, bring the ball up the floor, uh, pass the ball to the weak side and set a screen on the other side to get another guy open, and then they did a series of handoffs and off-ball screens uh, to get their ball handlers open and get get them the ball in space so that they weren't getting double teamed. But that again is an adjustment, and and this isn't you know the Blazers aren't able to run their offense the way that they want to run uh, their offense if if the Clippers are going to continue to be able to play defense the way that they are. So I think you know to kind of what, what I'm trying to wrap this in with is that, is that the the Blazers are the ones really making the adjustments here. They're the ones. Uh, the Clippers have seem to have the upper hand in, in the majority of facets, you know, of this series here. And, and I just think that the Blazers are at such a disadvantage here. Their backs are are squarely against the wall at this point. I think. I mean, you're down 0-2. What is it? 90% of teams who win the first two go on. It's some crazy stat. Uh, you know, the Blazers. The Blazers are are, are pretty much desperate at this point. So. Is this something where, where they're just overmatched? Is there are there any more adjustments left to make? Or at this point, you know, is Doc Rivers able to anticipate the adjustment that you can make, or is he able to make adjustments, you know, micro adjustments enough on the fly? Uh, you know, what kind of, at what point are the Blazers in terms of adjustments? Is there anything more that they can do? Can should they just get back to their normal game plan and see what see what see what works? Yeah, I definitely think that there are adjustments the Blazers can make. And before we get into that really quick, just to say how uncomfortable the Clippers were making the Blazers when your leading assist getter is Mason Plumlee with seven assists and Damian Lillard only has three assists, that's a problem. When your bench is getting outscored 43 to 10, that's a problem. As far as adjustments, I mean, it's tough. It's 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 the same thing that we talked about after game one. It's that, I mean, Al Freak Aminu needs to hit his shots. The Blazers perimeter players need to be a threat in order to open up everything else. And beyond that, I, I don't know what else they can really do because it's one of those things where the rest of the puzzle pieces don't really you know find their way until you can make that first counter move. What I'm trying to say is that in order to get to a point where you are competitive with the team, if they're trying a particular strategy, which in this case is leaving Alfred Camino basically wide open, and that strategy is working, and what you need to do is make shots and you can't make shots that doesn't really allow you to to progress forward in this series is going to be very short if the Blazers can't hit their shots and, it, and on some level it seems just as simple as that I mean is that oversimplifying it no I mean if, if you can allow the Clippers to to sag off you know to allow to to hide JJ Redick on a menu and sag off the way that he is and help out the way that he is I mean it's it's almost, I mean, it's almost comical at times how open Aminu is on some of those threes, uh, and and they're they're essentially playing five on four. It's it's pretty. I I just that it's so simple and it's so I feel so cheap saying that, but that could change the tide so much of this series uh, if you're just able to put a kink in their game plan just. Just make them adjust for once, I think. It would be, you know, allowing the Clippers to have the upper hand in this series allows them to dictate everything from the pace of the game to the tempo of the game to the tone of the game. I mean, you see the Blazers coming out, scoring in the mid-90s the first game, and some of those came in, in meaningless minutes at the end. And tonight, you know, by the time the game got out of hand, the Blazers only had managed, you know, 79, 80 points, you know, and, and maybe it was before that, you know, if not for a few cheap shots at, at, at the end of the game, they would have ended with, you know, 83 points. 
Uh, and that, to me, is showing that the Clippers are completely able to dictate the tone and the pace and the tempo of this game. I mean, that's what they want to do is force the Blazers into shooting late in the shot clock, force them into turnovers, force them in, uh, force them out of being able to get the ball uh, in the players' hands where they want them to get the ball, which is what Terry Stotts has been able to do all season. That's what their offense is essentially predicated on is getting guys in position to score. Uh, the Clippers have been able to completely take them out of, out of this by neutralizing uh, the Blazers' primary ball handlers in C.J. McCollum and Damian Lillard. So, you know, if those two are going to combine for 30 points, you're going to have to have, you know, more than Mason Plumlee, you know, stepping up, uh, more than Gerald Henderson in Game 1 stepping up. You, you're going to have to have Alan Crabb, you know, get 10, 12, 13, 14 points. Uh, you know, towards the end of the season, you know, Al Farouk Aminu set his career high in terms of points, you know, with 28, I think, uh, you know, and then against the, I believe, the Thunder toward the end of the season, he had 27 points. I mean, so those those were games where the Blazers handily won. You have a guy, you know, going from two for eight from behind the arc. If he goes, even hits half of his shots, four for eight, uh, allows... Uh, you know, forces the Clippers to actually honor him a little bit if he hits two shots in a row. You know, I don't know if if Doc Rivers would just continue daring him or not, but we won't know until he hits he hits a couple of shots in a row. So that to me has to be the first first piece of the puzzle. That's going to be the the first point of attack here for the Blazers. If 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 a wide open guy is not going to be hitting his shots, how else are you going to force the Clippers to adjust? their game plan because I don't see it I don't see that happening yeah we're talking about adjustments and just to go back to one more Twitter question maybe put a cap on it uh, coming from the row picks says it about as real as you can say it can we really win a game (laughs) that's the question can the Blazers win a game well if you look up and down the, the lineups here on paper I mean in terms of at least starting lineups, and they have the sixth man of the year in Jamal Crawford. So I know that Cole Seven Aldridge, time right. sixth man of the year. So I know that Cole Aldrich, you know, isn't isn't a headline player. Neither is Austin Rivers, Wesley Johnson. You know, these guys aren't guys. You know, Jeff Green all the time. These aren't guys you expect to turn the course of a series. But you do have the sixth man of the year in Jamal Crawford, who has lit up the Blazers historically. Uh, and then you have that starting lineup, you know. Uh, and Ba Mute is kind of a wash offensively, but the way that he's able to put the clamps down defensively on CJ McCollum without even doubling. I mean, every time CJ tries to go ISO, and Ba Mute is there to stop it, uh, and he's able to disrupt the passing lanes with his length as well. Uh, you know, anything that these Clippers have thrown at the Blazers this series, it hasn't been countered to the point where they've been forced out of doing that game plan. You know, Dame split the double team tonight and got to the rim a little bit. Did that stop the Clippers from leaving Aminu open? Because I don't don't recall seeing them adjust the game plan too much. They weren't trapping as hard as they were, but they still certainly were hedging. They still certainly were sagging off certain guys and leaving other guys open in order to give extra attention to the Blazers ball handlers here. So I am looking up and down the lineup here. You have two way player, you know, maybe best, best two way point guard in the league. I mean, I think you're going to put him above Kyle Lowry. I would assume, I think Chris Paul offensively, offensively and defensively, uh, you know, I mentioned in Mute what he's able to do on the, the defensive end, even though he's a wash offensively, Blake Griffin, the dude is ostensibly healthy from what we can see, having had 35 games of now, it's actually could be a net positive of being rested for the playoffs. I mean, maybe he's not fully healthy, but he's got some spring in his legs. You can see that on both ends of the court. Uh, DeAndre Jordan, I mean, this is a top five defensive, uh, top three defensive center in the NBA, uh, if not, you know, top two depending on who you ask. Uh, I mean, you're going to take 18 boards, five dimes, and three blocks from your center any day. <laughs> and a center that doesn't complain about not getting a lot of shots, he only shot four times. It doesn't matter. Exactly. He had huge presence. I mean, the, the biggest liability they have uh, offensively 
uh, I should say the biggest liability they have defensively is Redick, and they've shown that the Blazers haven't made them pay for that. The biggest liability they have offensively is DeAndre Jordan's free throw shooting. And the, so far, the Blazers haven't been able to make them pay for that. Uh, Jamal Crawford off the bench has been, certainly has been effective uh, in the first game, and he was able to hit enough shots in the second game uh, to that where the Blazers, even if he's not hitting his shots, the Blazers have to pay attention to him. You see Alan Crabb uh, up in his jersey, up in his grill, as much as he possibly can be without drawing a foul. I mean, you see guys draw fouls on him all the time for saying, and you saw Damian Lillard tonight on that foul on the three-pointer I mean the attention that Jamal Crawford gets even if he's not hitting his shots can swing you know the balance of a game this Clipper lineup it's easy to look at these guys and see what they've done the last handful of postseasons and that embarrassing uh, second round loss to the Clippers last year and you know even we were kind of making light of it on the podcast last week and and maybe you know, maybe I was I was maybe overstating it a little bit, you know, talking about maybe their lack of chemistry with DeAndre Jordan, you know, trying to leave last summer potentially and, and Blake Griffin punching the training staff and and this and that. Maybe maybe I was overstating that a little bit last week. I don't know, because the Clippers seem to be playing more like a team than the Blazers do at this point. Yeah, and I mean, one more time to the Clippers bench, they had five players that had double digit minutes in this game uh, they only had one bench player that played uh, Pablo Prigioni who only played one minute but for the rest of those bench players on the Clippers the rest of those five players every last one of them had a double digit plus minus every last one of them had a plus minus that was above 15 that's nutty so just to go back to the question can the Blazers win a game yes of course they can uh, can they win a couple games at home possibly is it going to be that the Blazers need to get streaky? I mean, this is something that I thought was going to happen in Game 2, frankly. I thought the Blazers were going to get, get get streaky and force, like we've been talking about, like you've been talking about, force the Clippers to adjust. Even if it's only for, you know, five or six minutes at a time, the Blazers hit a good amount of shots, and it just hasn't really happened yet. So, yes, I think they can win a game, but obviously you don't like looking down the barrel of double, uh, double 20-point losses. That's not a great place to be. Well, you have to exploit an advantage, right? So if your advantage is Redick is a weak link defensively, then you have to be able to score with the man that he's guarding, uh, which in this instance is Aminu. So that's something that the Blazers aren't able to do. Uh, you know, So far, DeAndre Jordan's foul shooting hasn't shifted the tide of this series to any meaningful in any meaningful way. Uh, so that's an advantage that they're not taking there. Uh, you know, whether or not that's on the table, uh, you know, we, you could debate the effectiveness of it, uh, of hacking, quote unquote, hack a DeAndre Jordan. Uh, you know, advantages against the bench. You know, if you compare the two benches, the Clippers have done a lot better than the Blazers have so far this series. So they're obviously not exploiting that advantage. The Blazers are a great offensive rebounding team. Uh, are they exploiting that in terms of second chance points? Is this helping them get uh, extra second chance points? You know, not to the degree that it's affecting this series. So, this is all about the Blazers, you know, having advantages and not exploiting them, and the Clippers, on the other hand, being able to exploit their advantages. You know, they have uh, Blake Griffin being guarded by Aminu and Harkless. Uh, you see the performances that Blake Griffin's able to put up. Uh, you see Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum's defensive deficiencies. Uh, you've seen how Chris Paul's played. I mean, 25 points uh, tonight, I think, says it all. He hit half of his shots. Uh, they're exploiting that advantage that they have. Uh, DeAndre Jordan, as a mobile, uh, lengthy big, able to trap and double team, and they can do switches on defense with Blake Griffin and, and other guys in their front court as well. Uh, you know, that's an advantage that they're able to, to exploit. The Clippers have, have completely dictated, uh, and, and I'll get back, to, I'll, I'll you know say this again, they've just managed to dictate everything uh, in this series so far, the, the, the pace and the tempo and the tone. You know, every, everything in this series uh, has, has gone the Clippers' direction. And until the Blazers are able to, you know, actually take what the defense is giving them, 
and and make him pay for it. I don't see I don't see this this series turning uh, in favor of the Blazers at all. And, I, and you know maybe they'll be able to get a win at home, but I don't I don't see this series being particularly competitive from this point on. I still think that it's possible. It, the road to that competitive series doesn't look as smooth as it did, obviously, before the series started. But I'm just going to go back to this. I think the Blazers need to go on a burst of some sort. If they can do that, I think it's going to open all, open up a lot of other possibilities. But until that happens, it's going to be more of the same, which isn't very good. Absolutely, and and so we'll have, you know, we'll have several. We'll have a, at least two more games. Uh, to look at and and maybe we're being a bit reactionary here as as we're going you know literally we hit record uh, within minutes after ending the Blazers game tonight uh, you know a couple of disheartening 20 point blowouts in a row uh, is going to dictate the way that uh, you know that that people talk about about the game so maybe you know they'll come back Saturday for game three at home get a few nights of rest at home uh, and maybe be able to hit a few of their their open shots, and maybe force the Clippers to adjust. And maybe we'll be, you know, by that by the next time we're meeting for this podcast next week, uh, we'll be talking about the you know the Blazers heading back to L.A. and seeing if the tides of this series have been turned at all. But until then, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what to think. And and I I, I think you're absolutely bonkers for sticking with the the, the seven game uh, prediction that you had at the beginning of the series. Well, remember the Blazers were within four at halftime and within six after the third quarter. I mean, it was a close game. Absolutely. And Blazers didn't play that well, but they were in it most of the way. It looked worse than it actually played out. I mean, game one was much more of a hot mess than game two was. So I'm going to stick with that seven-game series. Blazers winning in seven on Ooh. the road to the finals 2016. <laughs> ah, unbelievable, man. So, yeah, I think it, what it kind of you know, maybe comes down to uh, and in some ways is, you know, the Blazers even facing the adversity, they were able to keep it close, but, you know, for the, for most of the game, but closing out uh, games, closing out games down the stretch uh, is going to be really important for this team going forward. Uh, and closing out this podcast is going to be really important for you and I going forward. Uh, so I want to thank all the listeners uh, for joining us this week uh, on the Blazers Edge podcast. Yeah, definitely. Chris, I want to thank you for joining me in my home here in my beautiful downtown Portland building. It's actually past midnight. We're probably waking up the neighbors. So like you said, good time to wrap it up. Uh, as always, our intro and outro music can be brought to you by Odar. You can check out his work at soundcloud.com slash Odar Beats. Be sure to tune in for the Blazers Edge midweek podcast with Phil Masons and Dave Deckard. And for Chris Lucia, I'm Brandon Goldner. And remember, if you're recording a podcast in a glass box, get plenty of insulation. Mm-hmm.